I've been in Jerusalem. We were in Jerusalem. We looked into the cave where they buried him. And it says he is risen. He is not here. He is gone to live forevermore. What he came to do, he accomplished. And so now we rejoice in the hope of his coming. The same one who died on the cross, the same one who rose again, the same one who ascended into heaven, had two angels dressed in white apparel said, Why gaze you up into heaven as he disappeared? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner, and he's coming again. Amen. How many eyes are looking for him? He's coming for them that look for him. He's coming for them that love him. And I want to encourage you tonight, just with these words, of get ready, the King is coming. We're closer to the return of Jesus Christ than ever before. Never have there been so many signs that have been so completely fulfilled that point to the soon return of Jesus Christ. And I am looking at the book of Peter, 2 Peter, chapter 3, a powerful word from the Lord. As I was doing a little workout on the tread, in the gym area in our condo building, I was in meditation and I said, Lord, what would you have me share on Sunday night? And this portion of scripture dropped into my spirit from 2 Peter chapter 3. I will try to go down through verse after verse because it searches out the heart of men and also stirs our heart of those who believe in the fact that Jesus Christ is going to literally return again. I know there are those who have said, oh, we've heard that for so long, but where is this coming? Peter addresses this fact that there are those who will mock the coming of Jesus Christ. We have many today who are even saying to me, oh, we've heard that for years. Where is it, the appearance of his coming? You say he is coming, but nothing's changed. Things continue as they are. And we do not see the evidence of his return. Aren't you glad that man does not determine the time of the return of Jesus Christ. It's already in the mind of our God the moment that Jesus Christ will return and he's getting his church ready. There are those who've had spiritual experiences of late and they said there's a buzz in heaven right now because there are those who have died that have been brought back to life and they said there's such an excitement filling the heavens because it's known abroad throughout the heavens that Jesus is coming back for his church and that the marriage supper of the Lamb is being prepared and many are being prepared there in heaven for this great event that Jesus Christ said that we would sit together with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb the, the wedding celebration of we the bride of Christ with him our heavenly bridegroom well I've got a buzz in me that something glorious is about to happen. Jesus Christ is going to return. And we are not going by what men in their mockery say about him, but by what we know by the word of God and in our spirit. Now, the Apostle Peter concludes his second epistle by saying this in chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. He said, you've heard these things before, but I'm going to stir these things up. How many know, and I sense this like never before, that there needs to be good old-fashioned Holy Ghost preaching to stir up a lot of truths that have been laying dormant in the church and in their preaching. Amen. When is the last you've heard somebody thump up, Jesus Christ is coming? You must prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. I can tell you it's been a long time. I haven't heard a good old-fashioned message lately that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Oh, I know we talk about it. There are those who are talking about this. Thank the Lord for it. But how many are really excited about the moment that Jesus Christ is going to return? We need to have our hearts stirred, our remembrances brought into acute recognition of the fact that this is a reality. Jesus Christ is coming. Now, even Peter was talking about this way back 2,000 years ago. He said, well, if he was trying to stir them up, it must be a greater challenge right now. How true it is. He said, I want you to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. 
Now, these are not glib words. They're not thrown out there to throw aside if we don't want it or not. He said, these words were spoken by holy prophets. These words were spoken by us, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Knowing first, note this, that there shall come in the last days before he comes scoffers, walking after their own lusts, their own passions, their own desires, their own thinking. Has there ever been a time when we've had people so mad in their own thinking, so overwhelmed with their abilities, so passionate about what they think and promoting it against the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the, the Apostle Peter says, I want you to know that in the last days, there's going to be an intensity of scoffers. They're going to mock you. When you talk about Jesus Christ coming, they're going to point the finger and laugh in your face. But he said, I want you to understand, dear saints, that what you have believed and heard have been taught to us by holy prophets. The word of the Lord has been established by godly men. It has also been proclaimed by holy apostles. Those who have entrusted their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him to be true. There is no one like unto him. So he's trying to encourage them. Not that they're believing in some fantasy or some fairy tale that Jesus Christ is going to come again. He said, I'm telling you what I've taught you and the holy prophets have declared. Jesus Christ is coming back again. Amen. He said, now many will scoff at this when you talk about this. And even now there will be those that they can hear this message out there in the world. They said, oh, Rutledge, come on. We've heard this for years. But where is this coming? And then the Apostle Peter says, I'm going to address that. I want you to understand this. Listen to what I have to say in this fact, in this third chapter. And then he goes on to say, in that uh, verse 4 and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation now they're mocking this saying look even since our fathers our forefathers have passed away there has been no sign of his coming even from the beginning of creation they're taking it right back not just for the the coming of or the ascension of the lord they're mocking way back from the very beginning of creation for they for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water he's I'm going to remind you of something and I want you to tell all your scoffers that whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished let them be reminded and it's proven scientifically that there was a great cataclysm that the earth was literally destroyed by a flood. The waters overtook the earth and only eight of all civilizations survived. Noah, Mrs. Noah, the three sons and their wives. Only eight were spared in the ark of God as God directed Noah. Now can you imagine, and I've been thinking this, as Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. I want you to weigh that out because I've been pondering this this last while. As it was in the days of Noah. You have to know what it was like in the days of Noah. So we went back to the book of Genesis. We won't time to get, take time to go into all of that, but you can read it there. As it says, there was violence, there was terror, and there was insurrections and filling the earth terrorism like like we see today and there wasn't a place of peace corruption beyond description filling the earth and god says i cannot take it anymore i have given time for man to repent and he gave his servant noah to preach about the coming judgment of god they only mocked him and as they do today, they're just mocking those who preach that Jesus Christ is coming and the judgment of God will come upon the earth. But the Apostle Peter said, I want to remind you, dear saints, that what God did to that generation 
is the same God that's going to deal with this generation and with this world as we see it today. I was looking at the situations that we have in the world today and is there a country that has peace? We have, we have the, the Christmas message and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It doesn't say peace on earth, it says on earth peace. There will be peace on earth, but not because of what God has done in our hearts. But there is no peace as we see it in nations of the earth. There's wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom. I was reading this yesterday, all the description of the things that would be happening upon the earth, and we see it intensifying. Kingdom against kingdom. That means within a kingdom, there'll be those rising up insurrection one against another. We look at Egypt, we look at Syria, we look at Iran, we look at Libya, we look at all the nations, there is an unrest. We look at even the Western world, there is unrest in our own nation. We see the nation south of us in its turmoil. There is intensity of turmoil and strife, men despising one another and turning one another. The only hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody's got to get the good news out. Our only hope is in Him. Our only answer is in what He has done and what He can still do to transform lives. The Apostle Peter, at this time of his life, maybe with trembling hand writing and trembling voice speaking, saying, I want you to know, dear saints, what God has said through the holy prophets, what God has said through us, the apostles, shall surely come to pass. For the God that destroyed the world by a flood is the same God who has reserved in heaven the fire that shall consume not only the earth, but the heavens also. When I looked at that, I said, this is going to be a massive thing that's going to happen. What was upon the earth as a flood is going to be intensified by fire. Because not only will the earth be consumed in fire, but also the heavens, the heaven above us. Because wherever man is gone, he's contaminated. How many know that? The moon's contaminated. The, the uh, planets above, they're trying to reach them. We can't even solve our problems on planet Earth. What are we doing out going to the planet Mars and planet or to the moon and reaching out there when we can't even take care of our needs here on the earth? This planet needs a visitation of God. This planet is doomed for the fires of God's great judgment. And I know we don't like to hear this, but it's going to happen. As sure as I'm standing before you, and as the holy prophets declared it, and also the apostles, that there shall come a time when God says enough. And there's going to be a disaster that will hit the earth. And when I was looking at this, and I saw that in right now in Syria, the greatest persecution of Christians. And I looked upon the lifeless faces of children. And they were all wrapped in white. I don't know if some of you saw it. And I, I looked at it and I, I, I was fixed on it. I could not believe this is just happening. They went into Sabur, uh, an area of where they thought it was safe for Christians, where there are a lot of Roman Catholic Christians and uh, Orthodox. And they went in there and they were burning down their churches, taking uh, children as well as women and killing them, massacring them. One after the hundreds of them, destroying their lives. Where is the voice now of the Western? And, we're, and it's, it's a, a holy war against the people of God. And I don't hear anybody crying out against this only what's been put in, into uh, certain areas of the media. How long can this continue? This is intensified. There have been more Christians persecuted and put to death in the last 20 years than there has been in all previous time in history. Is the end at hand? Can this continue? 60 million abortions in America alone. This, the blood of innocent crying out, God is hearing and action will be taken. If there's ever a time we need to proclaim the dynamic gospel of Jesus Christ, our only hope in His power and resurrection and His salvation, 
is today. Amen. And I'm glad that even though the picture is dark and the judgment is coming, there is still the mercy of God. What a wonderful hope. And as I was reading this, two words were leaping out at me. You have two verses here. And it, and it declares, But the heavens and the earth, verse 7, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire, against the day of judgment, and perdition of ungodly men. God said, I'm reserving. I know exactly when it's going to happen. But beloved, look at it. He's talking to us. You who love the Lord, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. You know, we, we look at this and we say, well, Lord, you know, this has been a long time we've been waiting. And Peter says, I just want you to know with the Lord, a thousand years is one day. So now we've had 2,000 years, it's just like two days. In our thinking, a long time. In the mind of God, a short time. Just two days from that which Peter had declared, and even from the beginning of creation, has been just a short week. And beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Don't be ignorant. There's no bliss in ignorance. Understand what God is saying. So if you can hear the scoffers mocking what God is saying, that things are not going to happen. For years we believe this. Just let them know that a thousand years is as one day to God. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but His long-suffering. He's long-suffering to us, Lord. Not willing that any should perish, but that should all of us should come to repentance. And I looked at that and I underlined my, in my Bible, long-suffering. Why is God delaying the judgment? Long-suffering. Why is God waiting? Why did God wait in Noah's generation? Methuselah, the father of Noah, he was 969 years of age. And after he died, just days after, the flood came. That was all in divine sync, God's divine timing. And I don't know what will be the exact timing moment, but God has it planned out that in His long suffering, He's giving time for earth dwellers to repent. He's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't delight in punishment. God doesn't want to do this upon or inflict this upon mankind. He's reaching out. He's trying to get preachers to preach the gospel. He's trying to get God's people to share the good news. To let people everywhere know there's hope in Jesus Christ. Our answer is in Him. And so we're experiencing right now the long suffering of God. If it hadn't been for the mercy of God or the long suffering of God, He would have put an end to the world long ago. Aren't you glad that God's in control and not us? And so, this is one reason, the long-suffering of God. Not willing that any should perish. What does He want? He wants all to come to what? Repentance. That means change of mind, change of life, turn around, let us turn to God. This is our good news to share with people, that there is still forgiveness with the Lord. But, verse 10 says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It will happen so quickly that people will not be prepared for it. In the which the heaven shall melt or shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Look at the, the impact of what will happen. They said the atomic bomb can do that already. It, it has the ability to melt everything with fervent heat. We don't know how it's going to happen, but God's going to do it. And in the light of all of these things, I'm going to ask you three questions. In verse 11, verse 14, and verse 17. In the light of what we have just been sharing, the Apostle Peter says this, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, if everything that I have made known to you, Peter said in this writing, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation 
and godliness? That's his first question. Seeing that all of these things are going to take place, what kind of a person should we be? What a challenge. If we know these things and believe these things, what kind of person should we be? He said, in all holy conversation. It doesn't mean your speech, your way. It means lifestyle. Conversation means conduct, manner of life, your lifestyle, your way of thinking. How should we be in the light of all these things that are going to come? Are we going to be like Noah's generation? They mocked, they scoffed, they belittled the man of God. But they sure got over it fast when the waters rose. No entrance into the ark. Their, their bodies began to float upon the waters and then be sucked beneath. They removed quickly their sarcasm, their mockery. When reality strikes, it will make a difference. But we want to spare these people. God so loves everyone. He's not willing that any should perish. We don't take any glory or delight to think that God's going to judge the earth and all these bad people are going to be taken off the earth. God is wanting them to turn to Him. That's the good news. That there is hope. There is forgiveness in true repentance. And seeing that these things shall be dissolved, that all of these things are going to happen, how should we be acting? What should be the conduct of our life? It should stir our hearts to say, My God, I've got to begin to live unto you in a holy lifestyle and pleasing to God. Then he goes on to say, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, we're in the heavens, being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, he has to speak it again, he repeats it again, he's so overwhelmed by it. In this revelation, Peter is so shaken up by it. He's so stirred by it, he said, I, I can hardly write this, knowing what's going to come upon the earth. He said, how should we be living? Verse 13, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth where he dwelleth righteousness. He said, I've got good news for you. It's not going to be disaster only, but out of disaster there's going to come the fulfillment of the promise of God. A new heaven and a new earth. Where there was corruption and devastation, God says it's going to be all burnt away and I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Wow. Can you believe this? Amazing. No wonder we are to be stirred in our spirit to say, My God, let me serve you with all my heart. Verse 14, it asks again, Wherefore, beloved, see, he starts at verse 11, says, Seeing that all these things be dissolved. Verse 14, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. He said, seeing that you believe these things, and you have seen these things, you know them to be true. Then, be diligent. In other words, don't be careless. I see a lot of carelessness getting into the church. Where at one time we used to be so on fire for God. Oh, they were burned with passion. We couldn't declare enough the things of God. Such a holy love for Jesus. We're losing something. I don't know uh, if I'm too old-fashioned or not, but I, I have seen a lot of transitions. And I don't see the great passion and devotion. And I know it's, it's been a, a chilling blast that's come upon us. And I've been affected by it. And I know there's two things that have really impacted the Church of Jesus Christ that has been a concern to me. Deception and distraction. In the last days, Jesus said a lot of deception will be taking place. People even saying that they're the Christ. They're going to say they're the Messiah. There are going to be many false prophets. We have more false religions today, you can't believe, out of, springing out of Christianity. Not false religions, as we know it from other countries of the earth, but coming out of Christianity. They say, they call themselves Christians. But no truth in them. Far from reality. No born-again experience. No life-changing moment. And yet it's filling... Western world and spreading elsewhere around the world. Where are those who really are diligent in their faith and in their devotion and their love to Jesus Christ? God help us. 
And I'm letting this speak to me. I said, God, there are times I was burning with fire, burning with passion, burning with desire to win the world. I'm trying to do a little bit going overseas right now, but I see my little, it's not that much, but it's better than nothing. Hallelujah. Trying to make a difference. We need an awakening. Yeah. I guess I have been in enough revival to know what the reality of, of the move of God is. I've seen God pour in His Spirit. I've seen lives supernaturally changed. We've seen things like you shared. We may hear more, brother, about people coming to Christ and even at the moment of despair in their lives, supernaturally being transformed by the power of God. I know this area needs revival. Canada needs revival. Amen. We've got a lot of programs going, but it's not going to happen by our programs. We need some fiery preachers in the country. We need some spirit-filled people full of the Holy Ghost. Lord, do with power from on high. Get it out there and with flaming tongues proclaim the word of God. Amen. Sweet talk is not going to do it. Mm. Pussyfooting around is not going to do it. Mm. We need something happening that will stir again by holy fire the church of Jesus Christ Amen. in the western world. Mm. There are more things happening in other parts of the world in Christianity than even here in the western world. Thank God I've been able to see it and enjoy it. But let us be diligent. With this in mind, look at that verse 15. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now he brings us out again. He speaks of the long suffering of the Lord in verse 9. Then he says again, and don't forget to this account, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as a brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. He said, we need to understand in our diligence in serving God that why God is sparing the world as it is is because of his compassionate love. His long suffering has even been taught by the Apostle Paul. As I share it with you, the world needs to know that God loves them and that just not preaching God's going to get you. God's going to destroy the world. It's going to happen. But we need to awaken them before it happens, that God loves them now and to repent now and to turn to Jesus Christ. This is the, the great call that should go forth unto the body of Christ and unto a lost world. And also in his epistles, he talks about the apostle Paul, speaking of these things, which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are learned and stable rest, and they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. They're twisting scripture in their own thinking. Isn't it amazing? You can take one scripture and have about three different interpretations. And the apostle said, I want to hear what the word of God says in its purity. Don't give you your interpretation or twist it. How many have twisted? Those who come knocking on your door. Those who are going through different places. And they twist the scripture. The one scripture and they'll twist it. And you say, where did you ever get that out of it? Because of delusion and demon activity they're able even to make it alive now in verse 17 again it says therefore beloved and I, I love that when he says beloved it means one that's deeply beloved he's not coming at the beating him over and he said I'm, I'm telling you I'm pouring this up I'm writing this with tears in my eyes with a broken heart to warn you to prepare you of the, the gravity of this, this time that's coming. And he said, Therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before, beware. Verse 11, seeing you know these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be, be holy? Verse 14, knowing these things that are going to come upon the earth, be diligent. Knowing that, dearly beloved, you have received the knowledge of this before. Beware. Being led, not, not being led away with the air of the wicked. Fall from your own steadfastness. In other words, you can be so disturbed and troubled by what's happening that you can be destabilized. You can be at one time so steadfast, burning with zeal, so diligent, on fire for God, and then something can happen. These ungodly people taking the word of God and turning it and twisting it can so shake you up if you do not keep in truth. That's why I said beware. 
You've got to be diligent in the word. You've got to be diligent in spirit. And you've got to be careful that the words that are going out there that are twisting scripture doesn't affect you. And you learn, you lose your stability of faith. Because we're only as strong in faith as our knowledge is in the word of God. Amen. So if the word of God is being twisted and the word of God is being mocked and belittled, and you begin to believe that. It's amazing how some people who are so strong in their faith and in the Word, I've listened to some of them. I said, you never believed that before. How is it that you're believing it? But they listen to these false doctors, doctrines and false teachers and they begin to look at it and begin to accept it. And that's why the apostles cried out, be careful, beware, be diligent and keep yourself holy before God for that which is coming upon the earth is soon at hand. For in these last days, these things shall happen. It's happening. Who's crying out? Who's stirring their heart before God? Who's saying, God, come forth, make a difference? It's only going to happen as we ourselves are stirred by the Spirit of God. It's got to start somewhere. So I said, Lord, can I be a candidate? The Lord let me relive some of the times over the years when I was able to thump out and preach out and cry out the warnings of God and that there is forgiveness with Jesus and our only hope and our only way is through Him alone. That we can turn people back to God. I still believe it can happen. I still believe that even hopeless people in their despair can turn to the risen Christ and find that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the power of God unto salvation. Amen. And that there is hope to those who trust in Him. Amen. Hallelujah. You want to be a candidate? Amen. You want to lift your voice? Amen. When I look at it, I say, I see what's happening in the world today. And even our own family. I said, Lord, let me make sure. Noah made sure that his family was spared. His three sons their wives. I believe in household salvation. If you live it, God will save your family. That not one of them will be lost. I didn't bring three children into this world to see them lost. At this moment, they're all on fire for God, serving the Lord. I'm thankful to the Lord. A son, David, who's gone through this severe time, he said, I'm a changed man, Dad, as he lay in the hospital. His eyes gaunt, his faith drawn, and I looked upon him and I could see him failing in front of me. But I knew the promise of God. He said, God gave me word, I will not die, but I would live to glorify the Lord. Amen. And I said, it shall be, you shall be raised up. We just encouraged him in the word. And so he's now standing again, preaching, sharing the word of God. Ruth is so excited. She wants to be with her brother in ministry. She's a worship leader. And uh, she has been stirred to come back into her calling and destiny. Even though the enemy tried to deroot her, take her aside, another path. But now she's being stirred again. You see her every night into the word of God. And I hear her worshiping the Lord. Whoa, praise God, how faithful God is. Jonathan, he's on fire for God in California. He's a representative for America. We sent him to evangelize America from Canada. <laughs> so he's down there. But isn't God good? Amen. What he's doing. And even our grandchildren, our grand great grandchildren, you can claim every one of them to be part of the kingdom of God. Not one shall be lost. And, and from one generation to another, they shall serve the Lord. But it's got to happen in our own hearts. Amen. If they see us weakening in faith, it's going to affect them. We've got to be so vibrant in our faith, so full of God, and so flowing in love, that when our children look upon us, they will see dad or grandpa or grandma or mom so on fire for God, that it will so impact them, that they too will say, we've got to serve God too. This is a stirring up time God has given to us to get ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You are stirring our hearts. You're stirring mine, Lord, and I do need a stirring afresh. We can get so busy with other activities, so weary, even with good things, that we're missing the best. 
So help us, Lord, to keep focus. Help us to hear your voice, to be moved on by your spirit, to be led by your spirit in doing your will. Help us, O oh Father. We need you. We cannot get careless now. We must be holy. We must be diligent. We must beware of all things and be on fire for you. And not be caught in the deceptions of the devil. Amen. Not to be overtaken by the things of the world. Amen. But to be filled with the Spirit and on fire for you, Lord Jesus. And doing your will. So when you come, we will hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. Help us in this, Father. We all need your help. May we see your will done in our lives, we pray. Yes. While our heads are bowed before the Lord. Just wondering how many feel as I do, that we all need a fresh stirring of God's Spirit in our lives, and that we are a candidate to say, Lord, do something more in my life. Are you ready for that? Do you want that? I want to pray that for you. But if, if that's how you feel, that you, you're a candidate, you want something more done in your life, would you just stand to your feet right where you are? As I'm standing, I want you to stand with me and just say, Lord, if you don't feel that way, it's all right. You can just remain seated. But if you feel that way, we're just going to pray, Lord, start a new thing in me. I want, I, I want God to do a new work in me. I want you. A new, a fresh work of God's Spirit. Spirit move in our lives. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come. We need you, Lord. We realize we cannot do it of ourselves. Of ourselves, we can do nothing. And we realize that even what we heard tonight... We cannot live this out except by the Spirit of God. And so, Lord, you see this precious people gathered and the openness of all of our hearts before you and our total dependency upon you that we can't do it without you, Lord. We need you. Stir our hearts. Keep the holy flame burning for in many, Lord, and of your people, the fire has gone out. Start the fire again, we pray. Rekindle it. And may we guard it well that it will never go out. Amen. Keep us in touch with you. Amen. Let your will be done, O oh God, in our lives. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. And while we are standing before the Lord, <coughs> is there a little water just that would help us? Out? Thank you, Jim. How many have children, grandchildren, family members that are not yet in the kingdom of God and you need them to see them so would you raise your hand you know they're not they're not serving the Lord they're not ready for the if Jesus should come they're not ready um, how many know you did not bring them in the world that they would miss the kingdom of God and that's why I felt like I said you know we'll fight we we'll have to fight for our children in the spirit realm we have to say Lord we, we are not going to lose them they're going to do your will. And I've seen it happen. Even when you feel it's it's over, it's not going to happen, God turns it around. How many of you give testimony to that? We've seen, and when they come back, they're going to be so on fire for God, so alive in the Lord, that you will just, well, you won't be amazed because you expect it. I, I said, well, I'm still amazed, but still I expected it. I mean, no faith expects it to happen. And so you, you want this, say, Lord, they're yours. They're going to serve you. And you're going to represent them tonight before the throne of grace. And I want us to pray together. That as we're praying, I want you to name who it is. Whether it's your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your brothers, your sisters. Start naming. So, oh God, I want them. And we're just all going to pray. You can pray aloud. That doesn't confuse God. Somebody said, well, if we all start praying, it's going to confuse God. Can you only one at a time? He's got, a, he's got a system. Oh, thank you. Now I can go for another hour. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yes. How many have names you want to mention? Yes. I know. And so I'm just going to play softly, but I want you to, to pray names. I would just say, oh, dear Jesus, I... And you know how to pray. Just pray. I'm going to pray for and name them before the Lord. 
and I'm going to model before them. I'm going to let them see. Now, you know, we don't, they don't need you preaching at them because that'll turn them off. I mean, you know, when people get pushing something at them, they back off. Just, just show them the love of God. Let them know that I'm here for you. And we said to one relative, we said, we've been praying for you. They've been going through a hard time. We said, and they're, they're not serving God as we know it. And we said, we're praying for you. And they said, oh, thank you. You know, we didn't say, you know, you need to pray, you need to do this, you know, point the finger. No, no, we don't bring condemnation. Just love. How many know when you, you can do nothing else you can love? We don't need judgment. We need, we need love. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? We'll leave it with God. But let us love. I had someone just contact me and said, can I share my heart? He shared the devastation of his heart. He said, I, my family has refused me because of my, some of the decisions I've made in my life. And he said, I'm, I'm brokenhearted. I, but he said, can I trust you? Can I share? And he said, well, will you judge me? And I wrote back, I said, I don't know how to judge, but I know how to love. He said, that's enough. I can trust you. I don't know how to judge. I know how to love. Can you say that? And it touched his heart. And he's stirring now. He's talking about coming back to God. If I had said, you know, yes, you, what your parents have said is right. And really, the parents have some concern. Sometimes parents feel this way. But that would have shut him up. I would have shut a door of reaching him. And I said, I'm not here to love. I don't know how to judge, but I know how to love. And so, love them. Don't, you know, sometimes with your own family, you tend to, we want to straighten them up. The parent in us want to, I'll straighten them up. But it doesn't work. But love does. So let's let's just. I want us to uh, to pray for these ones that really need the help of God supernaturally, and we're going to believe the Lord. I I think it's time for you know when you get stirred, isn't it amazing? You stir others. The excitement of what's happening in your life will have a profound effect.
And when you speak the word of God in prayer for that loved one, and the spirit moves, something will happen even though they're miles away. How many believe it? Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, let's lift them up to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lift our voices. Start naming them before God. Oh, Father. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'll just sing it softly as you lift their names before God. Encouraged, God's moving by His Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's make this our prayer. Today. 